chapter number 17. We're going to close out our study this morning in this chapter. 1 Kings chapter number 17. It's been a blessing, and as I mentioned the first week, uh, it wasn't my intention to preach through this for three weeks. Uh, my intention was, as I prepared this first sermon, was to uh, kind of preach through the, first, the chapter that first Sunday. And uh, the Lord had different things. We looked at the first verse and part of the second verse, that first one. Then last week we looked at verses 2 through 7. And uh, today we're going to look at the remainder of the chapter and see what the Lord has for us this morning. Simply titled the message this morning, God Always Provides. God Always Provides. Look at uh, 1 Kings chapter 17. Let's begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is, before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thy hand. And as she said, or as, and she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a fruit. Behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said. But make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For if thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. She went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fill, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you this morning. What a blessing it has been, Lord, as we've sang and lifted our voices to you. Lord, the arrangement of hymns that we've sung this morning is nothing but a blessing to our hearts as it reflects the holy God that we serve, the old rugged cross, Lord, that gave us hope, that gave us eternal life through your Son. Lord, then that we can love you and to serve you and to know the goodness of the God that provides for us. Lord, as the men of this saying, we come to worship. Lord, we lift our voices before you, the holy God of Israel, the God of our fathers, Lord, the God of our salvation this morning. Lord, we want to honor you through our study in the Word of God. We want your Holy Spirit to have a free course in our hearts and lives this morning. Lord, may you teach us as only you can. Help us to be ready to hear, to listen, and then apply. Lord, it's in your precious name we pray these things and ask. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we've seen, in, in, uh, God always provides. So point number one this morning is the provision is God's. It's God's that he provides. It's not ours. It's, it's what he has at his disposal that he gives to us. And so in verse number eight, we see that the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, and there I have ordered or commanded a widow woman to serve thee. And so we already know that in Elijah's life, God has provided for him. We said last uh, two weeks ago that in verse number one, Elijah comes onto the scene at a wicked time in history. We don't know what job he had or what he was doing. Maybe he was in Bible school uh, and God provided for him through that time of study. God was preparing him to become the prophet that is going to stand before wicked, wicked King Ahab and going to proclaim that God's not going to send rain until I come back and tell you that he will. And to have the, the guts, we might say, to have the courage to be the man of God and to be the mouthpiece, to be the spokesperson of God, to stand before one of the most wicked kings known to man and to be able to say, Thus saith the Lord, 
And Elijah says that because not only am I standing before this earthly king, it's before God Almighty that I stand. And God sees our hearts. He sees our minds. He knows our motives. And it's Him that we need to understand. We stand before, first and foremost, and everything else comes in line with that. So I might be scared to death, but if God says, hey, this is my message for you, and I need you to go proclaim it, then my job is to go proclaim it and trust God to provide and to protect me. And so Elijah has done that. And so God determined, though, in verse number 8, it was God's determination, it was God's decision to say, hey, Elijah, now it's time to get up and move. We saw in verse number 7 that after a while, this brook has come to dry up. In our lives spiritually, in our lives physically, when things begin to dry up uh, financially, we want to start moving. We want to start making things happen. Uh, I don't know, honey, I'll, I, can, I can ask for some extra hours of work. I don't know, honey, maybe I can get a second job. And instead of getting on our knees and saying, God, this is my issue. God, i got bills to pay. God, I need your help. I need your wisdom. And if God leads us to do that, then sure, let's go. But it, it should be our first step. Get on my knees and say, God, you're the God that provides. God, you got me in this place. God, you know I've got a wife and children. I not only need to provide for them, but I need to spend quality time with them. I need to invest in them. So if I have to take on another job or two or three, that's going to limit that. God, what would you have me to do instead of just rushing forward and trying to fix things? Well, that's our human nature, especially as men. I know sometimes uh, as a man, my wife will come to me and bring something that she just wants to share. My first intention is, how can I fix this? Let me go fix this right now. And that's not what she wants. She just wants me to listen. She wants me to be the sounding board and hear what she has to say. And so sometimes in our lives spiritually, sometimes in our lives physically, we need to stop. Don't run ahead of God. Stop. Get on our knees and ask God, Lord, what is it that you would have me to do? What's the decision you would have me to make? And so God has provided for him all his life. Now it's God's uh, decision where he should go. If I'm Elijah, I'm probably not going to go find some poor little water woman. I'm going to go to the bank. I'm going to go to the welfare office. I'm going to go find my boss and say, hey, I think it's next to hours. You got anything coming up? Elijah goes to God and waits for God to say, all right, in verse number 8, the word of the Lord came to him. Rise, go to his aircraft. He was sat by the brook. And you can imagine, too, with me, that as he's at the brook, when there's plenty of water, the ravens are coming twice a day, morning and evening, bringing bread and meat. Man, life is good, right? Man, I've got a mate. This beats Bible school. This beats wherever else I've been. And I just have the world for a living. And God's just providing it. And sometimes we get comfortable in those places. And so God will also move us to get us out of our comfort zone and make us again depend on him and say, Lord, that was good. Thank you for the victories in my life. Thank you for the plenty. Now God will lead us into a place of what seems like famine, but usually those places of famine, in here it's hard, it's hard, I'm hungry, I don't know. But when I start to get on this side and start to go back up the hill, the next hill, I look back and say, what a time of blessing. Sometimes those low points in our lives drive us to our knees. They drive us into prayer. They drive us back to the Word of God, and that's the times of spiritual growth. And so on this side of it, we look back and say, I, I didn't really appreciate it at the time, and I don't know that I want to go back there before. Thank you for taking me through the valley, because it's in the valley that we begin to grow, and our faith really gets strong. And if we would say faith is like a rope that I can tug on, it's in those times that we're tugging the rope, and we're beginning to realize the rope's not going to break. The rope is solid, because the rope is faith in God, and God's not going to let us down. And so he not only determines where we should go, he determines how he would provide for Elijah's needs. He's going to send him to a little widow woman. And so we see here that um, however he was sustained before coming on the scene, we don't know. God then used the ravens in verses 4 and 6. He said last week the dirty birds were coming. And, and I don't know about you, but it probably when the first bird came out, I'm like, oh, Lord, please, can't it be a blue today? Could it please just be a little red cardinal? Can it be something besides a nasty, ugly black bird? But as provision came and he fed and he was well taken care of, he began to appreciate the ravens. And sometimes I say, we don't know who God is going to use to give us the word of God. Who God is going to use to feed us. It may be a pastor that's just a sinner like you are. And yet we come to appreciate the feeding that God provides. And so God determined these things. And God used not only the ravens, but now he would use a little widow woman. Look at verse 9 again. Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belong at the Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain me. And so God has all at his disposal, the riches of the world, everything that he can, you can imagine God can use. God has it at his disposal. 
God has at his disposal everything and anything he can choose. But what does God use to provide for ministry? People like you and me. Right. People like this little boy and woman that doesn't have much. Because as I trust God with what he's given me and I give, God gives back to me. And then I begin to see the cycle of God's blessings in my life. I told you a place here. Go to Psalm 78 with me. Go to Psalm chapter 78. God has at his disposal anything and everything that we can imagine he can use. I just want to take us through a few verses here in Psalm 78. If you were reading through your Bible in, in the Psalms, if you've been reading that Bible uh, calendar, the portion of the Psalms, you've read this yesterday and today. But in Psalm 78, look at verse number 12. It says, Marvelous things did he in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt in the field of Zon. He divided the sea and caused them to pass through. He made the waters to stand as a heap. In the day daytime also he led them with a cloud, and all the night with a light of fire. He clave the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as out of the great depths. He brought streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. And they sinned yet more against him by provoking the Most High in the wilderness. And they tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. Yea, they spake against God. They said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Behold, he smote the rock, that the waters gushed out, and the streams overflowed. Can he give us bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? And by those two verses, by number 19, I just wrote, uh, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Absolutely he can. Absolutely he can. Verse number 20, Can God give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? Watch and see. God is good. God provides. And not only did they see these miracles of God as he parted the seas and as he allowed them to go through on dry ground, as he overtook enemies and gave them the land that he had promised them, he had provided for them in the wilderness. Their clothes didn't get old. Their shoes didn't wear out. They had everything they could imagine. And yet they asked the question, can God provide? And God, absolutely God. And absolutely. And God says it's a sin to question that. Look at verse number 21. Therefore the Lord heard this and was wrong. So a fire was kindled against Jacob, and anger also came up against Israel, because they believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation. That word salvation there is not talking about our eternal salvation. That's talking about the provision, the care, the much care of God. They trusted not in it. And yet they had seen God provide everything they needed, clothing, shoes, jewelry coming out of Israel, so that they would have gold and riches when they went into the land. God had been good to them. He had blessed them. And now they're questioning the salvation of of God. Verse number 23, though he had commanded the clouds from above and opened the doors of heaven and had rained down manna upon them to eat and had given them of the, of the corn of heaven, man did eat angels food. He sent them meat to the poor. He caused an east wind to blow into heaven and by his power he brought in the south wind. He rained flesh also upon them as dust and feathered clouds like as the sand of the sea. And he left it all in the midst of their camp round about their habitation. So they did eat and were well filled, for he gave them of their own desire. They were not estranged from their lusts. Verse number 32, for all this they sinned still, and believed not for his wondrous works. Look at verse 41. Yea, they turned back and tempted God, and limited the Holy One of Israel. Here's a nation that God led, basically, in front of them. He stood there in a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire and said, just follow me and I'll lead you. I'll provide for you in every way imaginable. And he did. He never broke his promise. They never went without anything. And yet, what did they do? They complained and murmured. They limited the Holy One of Israel. How dare us? I think a lot of times that's what we do. We hear a missionary coming in and saying, you know, church, I would love. I would give anything to be in China right now. I would give anything to be in Japan right now. God has called me to Costa Rica. And I would do anything to be there. That's where my heart is. If you would just support me, I'll go. We sit on the $5 in our pocket. We sit on the $20. We might give one or two dollar dollar bills. You know, I can get away with giving a couple. At least it looks like I gave something. It's no shame. We live in the Holy One of Israel. If I gave that $5, don't I think God already gave it to me? Can't he replace it if I trust him with that? Wow. And yeah. so we limit the Holy One of Israel. God says, hey, man, hey, woman, I, I would just ask you to step up and teach us nice little God. You know me, I can't. I can't do that. I can't stand it. 
We limit the Holy One of Israel. God says, if you're willing, if you'll be faithful, guess what I'll do? I'll make it happen. I'll use you in ways you could never imagine. And so here we're looking at physical provision. But this goes way beyond physical provision. This goes when we give God our hearts, my soul, my life, my family, my ministry. God will make things out of it that we can never imagine. But when we sit on it and limit the Holy One of Israel, what we have is what we got. We get no more and no less. Go back to 1 Kings 17. God had as provision the, the rocks that he could make water from. Out. God would just fly the birds over and let them drop in front of them. They had all the meat, all we could imagine. And yet they limit the Holy One of Israel. God could do anything he wanted, but what did he do? A simple widow woman that would obey him. A simple widow woman that would open up her home and her provision to this man. God had manna, well, water from rocks, gold and jewels, everything that you can imagine. And yet now he's going to ask the Lord to have some faith in him. God chooses you and I to provide for his local church and for worldwide missions. And we look and we say, God, I don't know how you do it. God, I've tithed. God, I've given to the church offering this month. I've given two missions. And yet my bills are paid. God uses us when we're Amen. willing to be vessels used by him. He's given you and I the jobs and skills that we have so that we can live, but also that we can support the local church and support the church. Luke 6.38 reminds us, Give, and it shall be given unto you. For with what measure you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. My problem is, our problem is, we like to give God our scraps. But we don't want scraps back from God, do we? Right. We want buckets of blessings, don't chunks of blessings. But yet we give God our scraps, and we expect blessings. Number two this morning, the provision is the choice of God. God provides. He always does. The choice and provision is his. Look at verse number nine. I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. Notice that she doesn't have much herself. She's a simple widow woman. By being a widow woman means she doesn't have a husband. So she's living by herself with her son trying to provide for him. As a widow woman in this time and in that culture, she couldn't have a job. She might beg on the street. She might find little things she can do. She might get a few little pennies here and there. But she's not making income. Verse number 10, though, that she doesn't even have firewood. She's out at the gate when he comes. Behold, the widow woman was there gathering sticks. In a famine, I might not have food. I might not have much water. But this shows just how poor she was. She didn't even have firewood to keep her home warm and cook her food. She had to go out and find some sticks. Oh, I found it. Look at this. What a blessing. We got it on a big one. This will cook my whole meal. I don't need these little ones. And she says she was picking up just two. I don't have much food either. I don't have firewood. I don't have much food, so I don't need many sticks. But God, thank you for the big one. Because this will do. Notice in verse number 12, not only does she have very little, she's hungry herself. Verse number 12, she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a king, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. Behold, I'm gathering two sticks, and then I go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. I, the only thing I can think of to bring as a little bit of meal was a packet of oatmeal. I don't know about you, but me as a grown man, this tastes very good. It doesn't last very long. I want two or three of these at a time. And a couple hours later, I can eat another one. If this was all she had to break the cake, she's going to eat with her and her son, and she's going to die. She, she had no plans. There was no foresight. There was no provision in her future. She couldn't see it. Um, and so I, I would imagine, as this meal became less and less in the barrel, and it got down to about this. She had been provisioning it. She had been rationing it. Well, son, we had a whole cake yesterday, but today we're going to have three quarters of a cake. Son, we had three quarters yesterday, but today let's try to get by on a half because I don't know when we're going to get more. And as that ration got little and little, she had one small handful left, and she's ready to cook it. They're going to eat and die. It's going to stink. What she said. But I can imagine, although that's what she felt, although that's what she's doing, she tells her son as she tucks him into bed, I know you're hungry, buddy. Don't worry, God will provide. 
um, that we do. None of us have much. None of us live in mansions. Yet we find God faithful. As we give, He gives. Again, not prosperity, but every need supplied. And it will be saved probably most of our wants as well. Although we don't live in mansions today. One day. John 14. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I want to tell you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again so that you may be where I am. Right? That's basically what he says. I know the last part is kind of my translation of it. Oh, but guess what? If I keep all the money in my bank, I might be in a mansion. Thank you, Lord. Uh, but if I give the missions, $2,000 a month coming out of a small church like this, praise God. Somebody else will have a mansion too. Right. Some little boy, some little missionary, some little military man that had no clue, but some pastor or missionary knocked on his door and said, hey, there's a little church in Ocoee, Florida, supporting me, and they want you to know that God died for you, and he'll save your soul, and you can spend eternity in heaven. And they accept Christ as their Savior. One day, that man... That woman, that little boy or girl might be in a mansion right next to yours. And every day they walk by with a smile on their face, they'll say thank you. Amen. Thank you for being faithful. Thank you for giving handfuls of purpose on a Sunday night so that I could have a mansion too. And don't get selfish. Don't think, man, I got a mansion. Oh, it's over a hilltop. Or take me home. I'm ready. No, take the gospel to the world. Give so that others can have a mansion too. Because you know what happens when you die and go to your mansion just over the hilltop? Everything gets left behind and it means nothing. It means nothing to anybody. Your kids might hold on to it for a few months, a few years, but it just gets to be something else they've got to store and move. It eventually ends up in a dumpster. It eventually ends up moth-ridden, moth-eaten, and rust-eaten. Right. It becomes nothing. Number three, the test of faith. There's a test for Elijah verse number three. Go. Go to the widow woman. And in his mind, maybe he's thinking, well, Maybe this is a risk. Maybe she was left a lot in her inheritance. Maybe she has more than I would imagine. Uh, maybe, maybe it's one bill. What's God say there? She shall sustain thee. This isn't one bill. This is the substance. This is sustaining that God's going to do there. So the test for Elijah, verse number 10, he arose and went. What does he find? He finds this little widow woman picking up sticks. God, are you sure? He says, a widow woman. And then he says, he found thee. Widow woman there. That's the right one. Are you sure? I mean, she doesn't even have sticks to go fire. And then she doesn't even have food, God. Are you sure this is the one? And God said, that's the one. That's the one. So what's he do? Verse number 10. As she's gathering sticks. Excuse me, ma'am. <coughs> ma'am? Me? Yes. Um, uh, will you? Glass of water, please. Please. I know you're busy. I know you don't have much, but can I have a glass of water, please? Sure. Why was that response? Because she had plenty of time. Oh, oh, hey, ma'am, 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 excuse me, ma'am. Yes. By the way, we're on your way back, will you bring me a little cake? I don't even have any. The Lord, your God, she says. I think she's saved, but she's pointing out this is the God of Israel. Hey, man, hey, prophet of God, this is your God. I'm saved and I'm trusting him and it doesn't seem that he's provided. And Elijah says, fear not. How many times throughout scripture from Genesis to Revelation, God gives us those same words. Even when Christ is promising the Messiah, fear not. The angel comes to Mary, fear not. We need to trust, not fear. And so we see that as he's asking for this request, there's a test in that for Elijah. I've got to ask this poor widow woman that has nothing, this poor widow woman that's picking up two sticks, to feed me first, that takes some faith to ask those things. And the response was different. In the, in the water, it was easier to give. It was something she had. With the food, it brings a different response. It was something she didn't have much of. And it was something she necessar didn't necessarily want to part with. How many things in our lives, though, is the same way? I'll give what I've got plenty of. But the things that I don't have much of that, we hold back. We don't feel that we have enough of these things that we hold back. Are we also holding back things because we simply don't want to part with it? Well, if God's asking us, we just need to give it over to him. We need to let God use it. Maybe I don't feel like I have enough of it, but if I'll turn it over to God, if that's what he's asking, most likely I'm going to have more than I can ever imagine of it. I'll have the blessings that come with giving it to God. 
As it seems, notice in verse number 12, she seems unaware of the command of God. It says, as she, as she said, as the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal and a barrel, and a little oil and a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. In 1 Kings chapter number 17, there in verse number uh, 8, the word of the Lord came to him, though, and said, I have commanded this poor woman. She seems unaware of the command. Verse number 12, she also seems unaware of this visitor, this prophet that's coming for provision. But God in his timing is never a minute too early. God in his timing is never a moment too late. God knows exactly what he's doing. And if Elijah will get up and go to the widow woman, if the widow woman will say, sure, I'll bring you the little cake, the timing of God's provision will be right on time and God will provide it. And so we see that's what happens. God, Elijah says, fear not. This is what God promised, verse number 14. Thus saith the God, Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, unto the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did. And so she passes the test, Elijah passes the test, and this simply shows the unseen hand of God working in our hearts, the hearts of His people. Sometimes a need is announced, sometimes there is a need that is mentioned, and the Holy Spirit begins to prompt us. He begins to lead in our hearts, in our lives, in our minds, and we say, you know what? I've been blessed this week. I had a little extra time in my bed sheet. I'll go ahead and give to that. And God uses that as we, as He meets the need and enables us, and as we trust Him. And notice the test for the widow uh, again in verses 12 through 15. She only had what she needed for one last meal. She says she's ready to eat and die with her son. Hard test. It's easy to rationalize why she wanted to. I can think through it, and I would have a hard time making that decision. My son and me versus some guy I don't know who just showed up on the scene. Am I going to give him my last news? But he had already told her that God would provide, God had promised. So she passed the test. She went and did. And the result is God's blessings in verse 16. The meal never failed. The cruise of oil never failed according to the word of the Lord. God never lies. God always keeps his promises. He always does what he says, and we can trust him. Amen. And so this might prompt us, though, uh, as he says that this will never fail. The cruise of oil and the meat will never fail. Or the, I'm sorry. The, I need to get my mind back here. Verse 16. The barrel of meal will waste not, neither did the cruise of oil fail. All right? God's promised that, and God's going to keep his promises. And so in that, he might tempt me, he says, until it will rain again upon the earth. Oh, Lord, man, don't let it ever rain. Lord, let me just get fat and happy on the provision you've given to me. Lord, let me just enjoy these things. I, I pray that it never rains. But you know what happens? There's a greater test. There's a further test. Notice the lesson, book number four, in the provision, verse 14. He says, until the day that it rain upon the earth. We go through times of life, some of plenty and some of famine. This is true physically, and this is true spiritually. There are days I sit and read my Bible, and I just say, oh, thank you, Lord. That's like Thanksgiving dinner. I'm just fed, I'm full, I'm happy. If I had two more hours, I would just sit here and keep reading. And there's other days I read my Bible, and I'm just like, oh, Lord, I don't know. I, I, I've prayed, I've tried to get my heart right. I want to understand things. I want to have that communication with you, and it just doesn't seem to be there. We go through times of great plenty and times of famine. Physically and spiritually, there's times like that. But our faith, these are the tests. True, uh, we must learn to remain faithful in both uh, plenty and in family. The test of faith is never easy, but it's necessary. It grows our faith in famine and it retains our faith in plenty. And notice verse number 13, God wants first place. Verse number 13, Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof. A little cake first. God wants first place. Our tithes and offerings should give, and giving should come out of the barrel first, trusting God to refill the barrel. Our giving should not be from the leftovers, the scraps. Because again, I don't want God's scraps. I want God's blessings. So mine should come out of the plenty and allow God to refill the barrel. It doesn't make much sense rationally speaking, but neither does most things we do by faith, does it? Hebrews 11, 1 says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If you want to take your Bible and look at Proverbs chapter 3 with me, Proverbs chapter 3, 
the adult Sunday school class look at this this morning. Proverbs chapter 3. I've quoted this the last couple of weeks a couple of times. Proverbs 3, verse number 5. Trust in the Lord. That, that word trust means put your confidence in, rely on, place your faith in. And so we might say faith in the Lord or trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. So but God, if I give the tenth and, and I give the missions, I don't know how I'm going to do it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Amen. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Be not wise in thine own heart. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy neighbor and marrow to thy bones. I had a little lady come up to me after our service a couple weeks ago, and she said, you know what? I've seen this, not just in money, but in health, in blessings, in family. God says you give a little bit, and I'll bless you in ways beyond measure. It's not always money. It's sometimes life and happiness right. and health that God blesses Amen. us with. But notice verse number 8. Uh, well, I'm sorry, verse number 9. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Listen, what I'm telling you is, we can give to God a little bit of what I have, and God can make sure that I have everything I need. He may not bulge my pockets with money. My bank account not, may not grow to be fatter than any other person in the world. But every time I need something, need, need, not once, need, need, God will provide. It will be there. David. The blessing is there. The mill shall not go dry. The oil will not go dry, as the Lord said, through the man of Isaac conduit. Be patient with me, I have more I want to give you. Most of the time we stop right there. But there's a greater test in this. Look at verse number 17. It came to pass after these things that the son of the woman the mistress of the house fell sick, and his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. She said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? Man, can you imagine after the blessing of God, we've got a victory, our faith has been tried, we've passed the test, I've got a hundred, yes, praise God, I passed that test. My son is dead. Are you kidding me, man of God? Is this God before me? Rewards faith. Is this how God rewards me giving a little bit of money to him? I gave him missions last month. I was faithful to give my time, and I, I don't know what else I can do. Is this really how God rewards faith? Some people will look at something like that, and they'll get so bitter, so cold and hard, and they'll turn away from God, and they'll never set foot in church again. Some people will look at a story like this, or they'll see that happen in the life of a Christian, and they don't want anything to do with Christianity. Shame on us for allowing people to see that picture of God. Because when God does something like this, it's not for the purpose of us getting cold and hard. It's for the purpose of God showing himself real and true in a greater way. So instead of saying, is this how God rewards faith? Why don't we get on our knees and say, God, I've been faithful. And you've promised to be faithful. What is it in this that you want to show me? What greater thing about you do you want me to know about you in this? Because I've tried to be faithful. I've tried to do what you've asked me to do. This is what I see through my eyes, humanly speaking. But what is it, God, that you want to show me? This mirrors the raising of Lazarus, if you think in John chapter 11. Mary and Martha coming running to Jesus. If you'd only been here, our brother wouldn't have died. And God says, I love Lazarus. And he began to weep, John eleven thirty five. 35. Because their hearts didn't understand who he was. So in John, uh, my, John 11, 25 then, he raises Lazarus. He says, I'm, in 11, 25, he says, I'm glad for your sakes that I wasn't there that ye might believe. Oh, what's God doing in this stuff? When it seems crazy and out of control, and we don't know why God's doing it. God is working in our hearts and lives to draw our faith closer to him and so that others may come to know and so in this greater test, it's a mirror of the raising of Lazarus. Elijah had no ability to bring them back to the son. Notice verse 19 and 20. 
He said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom. She's holding him. She's crying. This is my son. This was my only hope of anything. I I'm a widow. I don't have it myself. I can't get a job. I, I was hoping he would grow and he would be able to take care of me into old age. And now he's dead. I have no hope now. And so Elijah takes him out of her bosom and carried him into the loft where he abode and laid him on his own bed. He had no ability to do anything else. In verse 20, he cries out unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son? God, I'm the man of God. I'm supposed to have the answers. I'm supposed to be able to answer her questions, and, and I'm without answer. God, what can I do? Well, is this how you're going to treat this widow woman? God, can't you please? Verse number 21. He stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O oh, Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. So Elijah had no ability to bring him back. Elijah must rely on God's ability. If you understand this, God, Elijah is simply a conduit being used by God. You and I are simply conduits of eternal life. As we give to support the local church, as we give to missions, and as we live Christ before others, we are a conduit being used by God in ways beyond our imagination. Amen. Notice verse number 24. The woman said to Elijah, Now, by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is free. Thus seems a greater miracle than ever. Yes, God can feed me. Yes, God can provide a house. Yes, God can give me clothing and food and a church and a school. But now I've seen the resurrection and the life. The one that can give eternal life. He's raised my son from the dead. He can give life. And I've seen greater things. Now I know that you're the man of God. And now I know that this is the true God of Israel that I serve. And so her faith is restored. Her faith is renewed. And her faith is strengthened. And I believe so is Elijah's and so is that little boy that's looking up at mama saying, will God give us food? Yes, son, we will. And he did. Here's Elijah saying, Lord, are you sure you sent me to the widow woman that has nothing? Are you sure that's the right one? And God says, yes, Elijah, trust me. Trust me. I'll provide. Here's the widow woman saying, God, I don't know you want me to provide for a little boy and now a pastor. What am I going to do? Trust me. I'll provide. And God did. So, Christian, this morning I want to ask you, will you live for Jesus and give him first place in your life? Will you give him your time, your talents, your money, your abilities, laying up treasure above? And if you're not saved this morning, let me say three things to you. God has made provision for you. Romans 3, 6, 20, or Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He's made provision for you. He's made it so that you can receive the gift of eternal life. The choice and provision, as with the Christian, in salvation is his as well. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So if you're trusting religion, good works, giving, anything else, it's not going to work. God makes the choice and provision. And number three this morning, will you respond? There's a greater test. How will you respond to the test? Romans 10, 13 says, Whosoever shall call on your name of the Lord shall be saved. The provision's been made. The choice is there. The decision is yours. Holy Spirit.